conundrum of Coach 13. On an October morning, when rain streamed from the black clouds that swept above our Baker Street lodgings, I found my friend Sherlock Holmes in a similarly overcast mood. He had not had a case in weeks, not at least what he called a decent case, and he had been huffing and puffing about the house for two days. It was with some relief to both of us, therefore, that we heard the slowing approach of a cab in the street outside, and both moved eagerly to the window. The hansom did indeed stop directly beside our door, and after a moment a large and finely dressed middle-aged gentleman emerged into the downpour, paid his fare, and rang our doorbell. Holmes was smiling. Now what could make a rich American so distressed, Watson, that he would come pell-mell here to us from Paddington? An American, I said, drawn irresistibly as usual into Holmes's tantalizing games. Certainly, and I think a formidable character. And do you wish to tell me how you deduce all that, Holmes? I deduce his distress and his nationality from the fact that he just tried to pay the cabby in American dollars before recalling which pocket held his pounds sterling. As for his coming from Paddington, that was the easiest of all, for the driver of the hansom is Henry Brown, I'm surprised you do not recognize him, who always works from the Paddington rank. As ever, Watson, I apologize for the banality of these observations, but you did ask. By now there were footsteps on the stairs, as Mrs. Hudson escorted the visitor to our apartment. While I inwardly delighted to note that my friend had returned to his amiable best in anticipation of a new challenge, I found myself praying that it would be a challenge worthy of his powers and his pent-up energies. No sooner had the door opened than the huge, rotund figure of our visitor, bright in a cream suit, burst into the room like an actor onto a stage determined to establish his character instantly. "'Mr. Holmes!' boomed the American voice as both his arms swept forward to grasp my right hand. "'Benedict Masterson! What a great privilege to meet you!' "'Delighted. But I am Dr. John Watson,' I replied." This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. With equally booming apologies, he bowed charmingly to me and turned to my friend. Ah, yes, now I see. Unmistakable, unmistakable. The impression given was that he had found the first Sherlock Holmes of his acquaintance a little short of his expectations. Mr. Holmes, I wish to ask you to act for me in a business both mysterious and distressing. You had better sit down, Mr. Masterson, said Holmes, and tell us everything. And having settled his cream-covered bulk into an armchair and accepted a cigar, on which he continued to puff anxiously as he spoke, the American told us his story. I am a dealer in gold, gentlemen. Gold has been my life. My father owned small mines in Nevada, which gave us a comfortable living. In my turn, through judicious trading, I've made these assets yield a fortune. I came to London last week because your own Bank of England had made an order for a substantial quantity of gold bars to boost its reserves. The bullion was shipped in a Bristol harbor and transferred yesterday onto a chartered London train for transfer to the bank. I have been in London doing the paperwork— of which there is, let me assure you, no small amount. And I went to Paddington this morning to meet the consignment. The train was there. The gold was not. I see, said Holmes. Stolen. Undoubtedly. How much? We're talking four or five millions, Mr. Holmes. That's a large loss. Is the gold insured? Indeed it is, but you know insurance companies, Mr. Holmes. They are ever suspicious. And the circumstances of the gold's disappearance are, to say the least, rather strange. The details, Mr. Masterson, said my friend, if you please. Well, continued Masterson, tapping a thick cylinder of ash into the ashtray, I had asked to commission a special, an overnight train, and also insisted that it be discreet. 
not armored or escorted or in any way having the appearance of a specially secured conveyance. I was offered the charter of a passenger train which returns empty from Bristol to London once a week, and which railwaymen jokingly call the bad luck special. Not because anything has ever happened to it, but because it normally consists of thirteen empty passenger coaches, as indeed it did on this occasion. I insisted that the gold be packed in steel containers, each locked with a unique key. You will appreciate that gold itself, gentlemen, is a weighty metal. So each box contained only as many bars as would enable the containers to be carried. In order to prevent the possibility of them being removed from the moving train, I ensured that while they were small enough to go through the open carriage door, they were too large to pass through the windows, even with the windows slid down to their largest aperture. I then arranged for the doors of the bullion carriage to be locked from the outside so they could not be open until the train reached London. The train was empty then, apart from the driver and farmer of the locomotive. No, Mr. Holmes. It is railway practice for all trains to have a guard, a practice I was very happy to comply with since it meant my consignment would have an overseer throughout its journey, and to this end all the steel cases were loaded into the last coach of the train, Coach 13, where the guard could keep a constant watch on them. The man employed for the job was a Mr. Lyons, Mr. John Lyons, a mature and trusted employee of the railway company. Here, strangely, Mr. Masterson stopped and smiled. I, uh, I inquired whether he had ever worked on the French railways. Guard Lyons, you see. Guard de Leon. Holmes smiled politely and nodded. Oh, forgive me, gentlemen, I can never resist a pun. To continue, the train left Bristol at three this morning as scheduled. But when it arrived at Paddington at six, the steel boxes of gold were gone. Mr. Holmes, this was an impossible robbery. The train stopped only once for a minute or so to take on water. Hardly time to unload a single box of bullion, let alone a hundred of the darn things, weighing in at a hundred and fifty pounds apiece. And the guard? asked Holmes. Lyons claimed that he fell asleep somewhere near the journey and woke to find the bullion disappeared. He's being held at Paddington along with the driver and engineer, but all ardently protest their innocence. And with regard to other suspects, can you think of anyone in your organization who might feel inclined to take advantage of you? Masterson pinched his lips and looked embarrassed. Well, if I may confide something to you in the strictest confidence, my estranged wife, Laura still has shares in the company. She believes that she should have more. There is uh, some bitterness in this regard. However, I know Laura well enough to doubt that she is a thief. My friend simply said, Thank you, Mr. Masterson. I will certainly take the case on. Would you be so good as to wire Bristol and inform them that Dr. Watson and I are on our way? I will, sir. You mean to go there today? Indeed, yes. As soon as I have made a check or two at Paddington Station. Well, I surely thank you. I can think of no better hands in which to leave the case of the bad luck special than those of Mr. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Holmes did not smile. I never leave anything to chance, Mr. Masterson. Perspicacity and reason are the tools I employ. Forgive me, Mr. Holmes. As I say, I am fatally attracted to puns. We will keep you in touch, Holmes said, with all developments. Within half an hour we were at Paddington, but before boarding the Bristol train, Holmes wished to make certain that the so-called bad luck special was secure. The train had been shunted into a siding, and we were relieved to find that police responsibility for the case had fallen to Inspector Stanley Hopkins, a young but ambitious detective with whom Holmes and myself had had numerous dealings in the past. Hearing that we were being engaged by Mr. Benedict Masterson, the inspector agreed to watch over the train and make sure it remained undisturbed until our return to London. It was still raining when we arrived at Bristol, where we met the station foreman, George Willits.
an amiable man in his fifties, who gave the comforting impression of having been in his job for a lifetime, and knowing the whole business inside out. Willits had been on duty the previous night, and took us directly to the goods platform from which the bullion train had left. Though he did his best to be of assistance, he looked painfully weary. "'I apologise to you gents for my appearance,' he said. "'But I was on night shift last night, seeing out the special. I was just about to go off when the message came from London about the theft, so I've not yet been home to bed.' "'We won't keep you long, Willits,' Holmes said. "'I understand you were here when the bullion boxes were being loaded.' "'I was, sir. I supervised them myself. Watched them being lifted into the guard's carriage at this very spot, before I sent the signal to bring in the rest of the train.' The guard's coach was not connected to the train while it was loaded. That's right, sir. The rest of the train was shunted out of the siding and then coupled up just before she would to leave. And who brought her in? Tommy Marriott, the engineer, and his fireman, Pat McGlinchey. Old hands? Not quite so much a fixture as myself, Mr. Holmes, but they've been around the best part of ten years. They're sound men. Good. Now, if you'll bear with me a little longer, Willits, I'd like to ask you a little more about the gold itself. How many men were involved in loading the carriage? Well, sir, it was quite some operation. It took four men to load each box, two inside the carriage, two outside. Damn heavy things, if you'll excuse me, sir. Over a hundred weight apiece and damn awkward squeezing them through them narrow doors. It was a hell of a job. And how long would you say the whole business took? It was about half past midnight when they started, and about a quarter before two by the time they finished, so almost eighty minutes. And after it was loaded, was there any delay before departure? No, sir. The rest of the train, as I say, was reversed in from the siding. John Lyons, the guard, got aboard, and the door of the guard's coach was locked from without, sir, as per our instructions. One final question, Willits, if I may. I'm informed the train stopped en route. Yes, sir. She was scheduled to hold up for a minute or so at Swindon to take on water. It stopped for no longer than that, and at no other time. No, sir. The signalman would know for sure if she'd been held over for more than a minute, and that's already been checked. Holmes seemed to pause for a moment while he considered all this information, and then he said, Well, it's I'm most grateful for your detailed and, I have no doubt, accurate recollections. Now, if you will excuse us, Dr. Watson and I will take the next train back to London and leave you to go home and get some sleep. Inspector Hopkins was at Paddington when we arrived, and Holmes immediately requested that he arrange for us to speak to the railwayman who had commandeered the bad luck special on the previous night, Marriott and McGlinchey, the engineer and fireman, and the guard, Lyons. In a dark office of the railwayman's quarters, on one of the grimmer outer platforms of Paddington Station, the three men sat disconsolately on rickety wooden chairs. It occurred to me that they had by now been detained in this dismal place for several hours, and when Holmes and I were introduced to Lyons, he barely had the energy to nod to us. But he did speak, his words almost drowned in the muffler which half covered his mouth. I dare say you think me a thief, Mr. Holmes, from what you'll have heard. I'm not, sir. But what I have done is derelict my duty, so maybe I deserve what's coming. I want to assure you, Mr. Lyons, Holmes said, that my intention here is to uncover the truth and uncover it I will. If you are, as you say, innocent of any crime, you have nothing to fear from the law. But tell me how you think you failed in your duty. Well, I were meant to keep me eye on the shipment, sir, weren't I? But I fell asleep. It's not something I make a habit of, but this time I did. And woke to find the bullion gone? A nightmare, sir. I suppose I should have stopped the train with a pull call, but I was in a bit of a daze. How long do you think you slept? I thought about that, sir. I remember us passing through the White Horse Valley just before Swindon, and when I woke up, we were about ten miles out of it and past the Lumsey Water Tower. Holmes looked towards the fireman McGlinchey, a plump man with rich black curls. When you stopped to fill the tank, did you notice anything odd? No, sir. It was a dark night, and there were no lights there save the fire from the boiler. You couldn't see twenty feet beyond the train. Holmes turned back to Lyons. I would like you to describe to me the events of yesterday evening. Well, sir, 
Oh, I wasn't due to start my shift until one in the morning, so around about twelve I had a brown ale in the railwayman's canteen and collected some sandwiches and a can of tea for the journey. Just tea and sandwiches? Yes, sir, and, and a piece of seed cake, if that's not too much detail. There is no such thing as too much detail. Please continue with your story. Well, at about half past one I made my way over to the goods platform. They'd just finished loading the bullion into the end carriage, and the other part of the train had been brought in and coupled up. A gentleman in a suit gave us final instructions. To the engineer and fireman Tommy and Pat here, he said the train was cleared to London, with just the one brief water stop, which was under no circumstances to take more than three minutes, and if there should be an emergency, they weren't to leave the cab. At that point, they locked me in with the gold, and at exactly 2 a.m., we were on our way. About a half hour after, I had me sandwiches and a few swigs of tea. It were a clear night, and I sat by one of the windows and watched the stars. Contented with everything, sir. That's when I must have dozed, and, well, what happened after that, you know. Thank you, Lyons, said Holmes. Then he turned to young Inspector Hopkins with a new fierce gleam in his eye. If we may, Hopkins, I should now like to inspect the train. We made our way along the track to the engine sheds, and after checking the locomotive, searched through each of the thirteen coaches whose number I carefully counted myself, until we arrived at the last, the guard's coach, in which the gold had been transported. Now I have been assured, Holmes said to Hopkins, that the doors of this coach were locked from the outside for the duration of the journey. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Yet it was possible to move along the train through the coaches via the connecting doors? Yes. And what of the other coaches? I checked them. Their outer doors were all locked too, but it would have been impossible anyway for the thieves to have moved the containers along the train to jettison them from another carriage. The boxes of gold were too big to pass through the connecting doors. All that had been carefully calculated. And is it quite certain, I ventured, that the boxes could not have been opened and the gold removed bar by bar? Quite certain, said Hopkins. Not without the original keys. They were unique to each box. Besides, Watson, said Holmes, if the boxes had been opened here, then with or without the gold, they would still surely be here now. Speaking of which, Hopkins, the carriage is just as it was found when the doors were first opened this morning. As I said, Mr. Holmes, nothing's been touched. Holmes took an initial sweeping glance around the carriage interior, then stooped to pick something up from the floor. This brown paper, I presume the wrapping for the guard Lyons's sandwiches. Yes. This is can of tea? Yes. Curious that he had a can of tea? No, no. Curious that a man under stress should be so painstakingly tidy. I don't understand, sir. Never mind. What do you make of this, Hopkins? Holmes had picked up from the corner a loop of scarlet fabric, silken and ruffled. I don't know, Mr. Holmes. I was completely baffled by it. It seems to be a small decorative item of some sort from a lady's wardrobe. A hair tie, I should think, I said. How might it have got here? I don't know, Doctor, I'm sure, but I suppose it's theoretically possible that someone might have concealed herself in another carriage. Holmes had put the object to his nose. There is a perfume to it, he said, but faint, as though it had not been worn for some time. Could it belong to the thief? I asked tentatively. Possibly, said Holmes, though I think that might have been a thief too many. He stooped to replace the scarlet fabric on the floor of the carriage. I think we are close to a conclusion, Watson. Hopkins, I should like to talk to the guard lions again, and to the driver and his fireman. Please make sure that there is at least one other police officer present, and we must be sure to invite Mr. Benedict Masterson to our little denouement, since he's been kind enough to pay the fee for this investigation. By the time Masterson arrived, the clock was approaching nine, and we sat in the old mess-room bathed in dingy yellow gaslight. The rain rattled ceaselessly on the roof and windows, and, when we were all assembled, the three weary railwaymen, along with Benedict Masterson, Inspector Hopkins, a junior officer, and Holmes, and myself, 
the gathering became hushed and expectant. Masterson said, Well, this has certainly been a baffling business, Mr. Holmes, but I assume we're here because you've picked up some clues along the way. You are certainly a man equal to his reputation, sir. The inspector mentioned a red silk trinket of some sort. Yes, Holmes said. He produced the item from his pocket. This piece of perfumed fabric. The clear message is that someone was concealed in the carriage with the bullion. I see. And moreover, I put in, that the concealed person was probably female. Masterson appeared a little shaken. Female, you say? Oh, dear. If I may, said Holmes, we will return to that later. Mr. Lyons, let us revert for the present to the subject of your sandwiches. My sandwiches again, sir. Indeed. The sandwiches you took on board the train last night, together with the seed cake and the can of cold tea. You say you ate them just before you fell asleep. Yes, sir. You ate the sandwiches and the cake, you dozed off, you woke up again, and the gold was gone. Yes, sir. That's how it happened. And when you came round and realized the gold had gone, you say it was like a nightmare. Yes, Mr. Holmes. You were very agitated? I certainly was. Too agitated, I expect, to sweep the floor of the carriage. To what, sir? I presume you did not sweep the floor of the carriage at that point, in that disturbed state. No, sir, I didn't. With respect, sir, that's not my job. Quite. I wouldn't expect you to. Which makes it very difficult to explain why, when I examined the guard's coach this afternoon, I found not a single crumb on the floor. Now, can anyone here tell me how it's possible to eat several sandwiches and a slice of seed cake without dropping a single crumb? Or, come to that, a single seed. I promise you, sir, what I said about my supper was true. I remember exactly what I brought and exactly what I ate. I have no doubt of that, Mr. Lyons. Then what, sir? My point is merely that you were obviously not in Coach 13 when you ate the sandwiches. On my honour, Mr. Holmes, I swear I was. Oh, you were in a carriage, certainly, but you were not in the carriage in which your sandwich wrapper was found. The coach where you ate your supper, the coach with the bullion, never made it to London. Mr. Holmes, this is confusing, began Masterson. Holmes interrupted. On the contrary, Mr. Masterson, it's very clear. The coach containing the gold was uncoupled from the train when it stopped for water, run into a siding by those awaiting it, and unloaded of its cargo at their leisure during the night. It was a perfectly dark night. There was no moon. So the railwaymen, as Mr. McGlinchey here has recently confirmed, could from the water pump see nothing of what was going on at the back of the train. But Mr. Holmes, said Inspector Hopkins, the bad luck special has thirteen coaches. Everyone knows that. And you will no doubt yourself have noted that we passed through exactly thirteen coaches in our inspection of the train this afternoon. Oh, it has thirteen coaches now, of course, Inspector, Holmes said. And it only struck me after we had left Bristol and its pleasant stationmaster Willits that he had described to us in detail his whole engagement with the loading of the gold and the departure of the train without once mentioning that he'd counted the coaches before the train left. The fact is, he didn't count them. He didn't think he needed to. The bad luck special had always consisted of thirteen coaches. He wasn't to know that your accomplices at Bristol had added an additional coach to the train before it was attached to the coach carrying the boxes. A coach with its seats stripped out to make it practically identical to the bullion car. On that one night, the bad luck special had not thirteen, but fourteen carriages. When the train stopped to acquire water, it simultaneously shed a coach. And it very nearly, he continued, turning back to Lyons, shed a guard, too. You're a very fortunate man, Lyons. I don't feel fortunate, sir. Your good fortune is that you are still alive, and that in turn is because you were fortunate enough to fall asleep. Imagine if you had not. The train stops. The thieves uncouple the rear coach with yourself inside it. As soon as you see them, you become a risk to them. 
There's no telling what they might have done. What I believe actually happened was that as they were releasing the carriage from the train, someone noticed that you were asleep inside. They took the opportunity to move you into the next coach, along with your tea can and sandwich wrappings. You may be thankful you did not wake at that moment. Masterson wore an expression of amazement. I am full of admiration, Mr. Holmes. But at the same time, I feel somewhat desolated. This clearly means that someone in my organization has betrayed me. Which brings me back to the ring of scarlet silk discovered in the carriage, certainly an intriguing adornment to the problem, said Holmes. It could indeed signify the presence of a woman. But there is the mystery, I said, of how she got there or what she might have done. I think, however, said Holmes, that is a mystery with a simple solution. At this point, Masterson appeared rather tragically stricken. You're thinking... Yes, said Holmes. You're thinking that my estranged wife, Laura... Dear God, that foolish woman. Oh, come along, Mr. Masterson. You know full well your wife had nothing to do with it. There was no one aboard the train save the three men here, driver, engineer, and guard, and none of them had anything to do with the robbery. The three railwaymen looked at one another as though they had suddenly had revealed to them their entitlement to a joint fortune. As for the thieves, said Holmes, they are to be located somewhere nursing a horde of bullion, a part, of course, from their paymaster who is sitting here with us. Is that not so, Mr. Masterson? Masterson blustered and steamed. He was outraged. This was absurd. How dare you, sir? What evidence have you for such an outrageous suggestion? I had misgivings from the beginning. I could not understand why you came to me so quickly after the theft had been discovered when you had so much else to deal with. I see now that you were at pains to demonstrate to the insurance company that you were doing all in your power to recover the bullion, because, of course, if you could have both the gold and the insurance money, you would have considerably augmented your fortune. But worse still, what your partners in crime would have done to Mr. Lyons, had he not had the good sense to fall asleep on the job, hardly bears thinking about. You were prepared not just to steal— but to be an accessory to murder. This is speculation, Mr. Holmes. This would not stand up in court. You should be looking for another felon. What about that red silk ring? Ah, uh, yes. You've been very subtle about that, Mr. Masterson. Suggesting your wife's name one moment and the next assuring me that she could not possibly be implicated. I doubt whether you thought she would be, but you certainly sought to throw me off the scent. What was that item, if not a red herring? And is that not, for those who like to play games with words, another way to say, a red herring? What fun you no doubt planned to have with that joke, Mr. Masterson, had you got away with this business. Now it seems the joke is on you. That was one pun, Mr. Masterson, which you would indeed have done better to have resisted. But whether justice was fully done is a moot point. In expectation of reducing his own sentence, Masterson eventually divulged the names of his accomplices and led police to the embezzled bullion. And although he was committed to prison for several years, it was clear that once his sentence was served, he would continue the life of a wealthy man. "'I can't understand,' I said to Holmes a couple of evenings later, "'why you seem so damnably happy. A man is never more content, Watson, he said, than when doing well what his nature has fitted him to do. On which thought, will you pass me the tobacco pouch? I think we should indulge ourselves in a brace of good pipes. <laughs>